Okay, uh, we'll get started. Hello, and uh, in the next 30 minutes, we'll be talking about uh, WebAssembly based AI as a service on the edge uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, I'm Rishat, and uh, uh, I, I'm an, uh, I'm an under, a CS undergrad student at the University of Toronto, and, I'm, and I also work on the machine learning team on Finch uh, at SpaceX. Uh, Shivai? Yeah, hi, I'm Shivai, and I'm a contributor and maintainer at Layer 5, the service mesh community within the CNCF, and I'm also a developer relations engineer at MiniSearch. It's an open source trust based search engine. So, really looking forward to be sharing with all of you how we can leverage the use of WebAssembly um, to enable very easy access to functions as service within the edge. So uh, I want to start out with this meme <laughs> uh, when I start talking about WebAssembly, uh, which is that WebAssembly is neither web nor assembly. And um, uh, th this is an interesting meme, uh, meme and uh, this also depends on what you consider the definition of web. And um, uh, we want to run it on more than just web. We want to run it on edge devices. That's what we are excited about. Uh, so uh, what is WebAssembly if it's not web and not assembly, and why should you care about it if you are deploying edge applications, especially uh, m machine learning applications which are quite compute intensive. Uh, so that's what we, we want to talk about. So uh, simply put, it's a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. And uh, uh, what that means is it's analogous to machine code, uh, higher level than machine code. Um, and it's essentially designed as a compilation target. So you'd uh, have, uh, you'd probably have uh, s some JavaScript functions, some Rust functions, then use WebAssembly uh, to make uh, to make a compilation target out of it. Uh, so uh, uh, so then you'd probably use WebAssembly, make a dot, uh, uh, make a WebAssembly module out of it, and then run it with WebAssembly. Uh, so uh, yeah, you can essentially. Uh, Take take your code or take your functions, take your modules uh, fr from other languages uh, and compile them down to WebAssembly, uh, which is the idea. And uh, and the idea is that uh, you can see that it's not just your functional programming languages, but also scripting programming languages like Python, JavaScript that can be compiled into WebAssembly. So it's kind of a polyglot environment where you can use any of your uh, standard uh, like you know languages and that can be compiled into a WebAssembly target. So, uh, uh, so I want to talk about WebAssembly, and uh, uh, it's speci uh, especially I want to talk about this in context of Edge because it's efficient and fast, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you are not uh, u using. Uh, uh, it's pretty. Uh, it's higher level than uh, machine code, but uh, it's it's uh, pretty efficient and fast. It's also open and debuggable. WebAssembly is open source which is why we are presenting uh, ab about some of the work we have been doing with WebAssembly. And it can also run on non-web platforms, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, why you should think about using it for your edge applications. And uh, it's also uh, based on the open web platform, so you can also use it on the web um, yeah, of, of for edge use cases where you might have uh, uh, not a lot of bandwidth, not a lot of network. You can also use it for that. And uh, the WebAssembly security model is something uh, really interesting as well. It's not just simple virtualization, um, and uh, you, uh, you get uh, you tend to get a lot of security um, uh, with WebAssembly too. So uh, I want to talk about uh, how. Uh, uh, so Shivai, would you like to talk about how Wasm comes into the picture? Sure. So as we kind of recap over the past few slides, what we have seen is that you're primarily getting a lot of high performance bytecode. And why is that the case? Because what we're doing is that we are taking your high performance functions written in languages like Rust, and they're getting directly compiled to these bytecodes. So one of the common use cases where uh, how WebAssembly started was on the web, where uh, JavaScript functions that couldn't be that performant, uh, you could use C++ like mscript in to be able to run these highly performant C++ applications uh, and functions on web. Now we're also expanding it to server side and on the edge as well. And you're still doing that, that we can take your high performance functions written in 
very popular languages like C++ or Rust and convert them into this bytecode and then run them because of the small size that comes with this WebAssembly module. And as we mentioned that it's compatible with all of these various programming languages. And since it's a binary instruction format, so uh, like, you know, deserializing it and serializing it at the lowest level is very easy to do that. And again, like, you know, because it is running uh, as a native bytecode, it runs at a very high speed without a lot of performance overhead to worry about. Uh, so on this point, I would also like to add that, uh, 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 so if you think about something running at native speed, the first thing you think is, it's not, you, you cannot put the same thing on multiple platforms. And uh, uh, well, that's right to a certain extent, um, uh, especially in the case of ahead of time compiling. Um, so if you take, a, a, take one of the popular WASM run times, like WASM Edge, and try to ahead of time compile it into a .so file, which brings a lot of the native execution speed. It's also then tied to the machine type. So WebAssembly uh, in general is not not tied to what machine uh, it is running on. It's just an instruction format. You can run it. But, uh, if, if you try to do something like ahead of time compile it down, uh, 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 you would uh, essentially get native speed, but it would be tied to what kind of machines it can run on. And yeah, and one of the other things to just kind of focus on over here is since we're talking about function as a service, right? And WebAssembly as a service. So one of the other benefits that we get is that with WebAssembly, we are primarily looking at, again, the portability aspect of being able to run these WASM bytecodes anywhere uh, that we want. Because usually if you're using, let's say, a Python-based or a JavaScript-based function, uh, it will be more kind of limited and tied with the dependencies on the, the specific platform that you're running it on. So the platform dependency is also something that improves with uh, using WASM. And of course, finally, uh, when we're talking about machine learning, we know that it's very computation intensive, mathematical uh, computation intensive. So if, especially if you're running it on edge devices, you want high speed, uh, given the lo lower constraint, like given the constraints that you have with the size and also with the com competition uh, that you get with running a edge device. So it's really good for being able to do model inference, conversion, and deployments as well on the edge, uh, and that also very quickly. And that brings us to Wasm Edge. Uh, over to you, Rashid. So uh, Wasm Edge is a popular runtime to allow you to easily run Wasm for edge devices. And um, uh, which is also what we'll be showing in the demos and talking a bit about today. And uh, so uh, uh, we want to uh, talk bit, a bit more about how does WASM run on edge devices, uh, which is very interesting uh, uh, because we talked about all of these benefits, but uh, we didn't really think uh, talk, talk more about how does it essentially run the same code on all devices. Uh, what what's the fa uh, how, how does it do this? So uh, uh, what so what it allows you to do is have a fast, scalable, secure way to run your same code, and uh, by safe and portable we also mean that uh, uh, users and programs can only access what they have the right to access, and uh, we also mean that they sh uh, that one process should not create problems for other processes. So essentially, we want standard platform independent methods. Uh, uh, so uh, we want uh, to have our system calls standardized, and these should be independent. Um, so which is where um, uh, uh, so which is where we, uh, WebAssembly system interface comes in, WASI, uh, which solves a lot of these problems. And um, so what WASI does is it allows you to have standard indep uh, platform independent system calls. And uh, this is a very popular uh, tweet from the creator of Docker. And he says that if Wasm plus Wasi existed in 2008, there would have been no need to create Docker. And um, uh, so um, could you go to the next slide? So, uh, uh, the, uh, so I want to motivate this uh, and talk more about Wasi by starting with a statement, which is wrong, uh, that C directly gives you access to all system resources which it does not, uh, because it's far too important for stability and security. So, um, the, so the way uh, Wasm works is I've taken this image uh, from Lynn Clark, uh, and the way um, and, and the way uh, all applications work is uh, they ask the kernel, "Can I do this task?" And um, to, to which uh, the uh, so to which 
uh, uh, instead of uh, having all of these platform specific uh, ways to do system calls, uh, WASI allows you to have standard libraries. Uh, you can now use WASI in Rust and in C, just an example here, to do a system call, which is not tied to what kind of system, uh, what, what kind of CPU you are running the, uh, running the WASM code on. So, uh, uh, Shivai, would you like to talk a bit more about how WASM Edge and Kubernetes can come together? Yeah, absolutely. So, so far what we have discussed is um, the application of how WASM Edge as a popular runtime with ahead of time comparison can be used to very quickly do things like modern inference, especially from a machine learning perspective, but also you can do it for other high computational tasks. So let's kind of understand where does Kubernetes come into the picture. So we primarily know that what the main idea of Kubernetes is, right? That it helps you to manage and orchestrate your Docker containers. Now, the proposal is that what we can do is that we can either run these WASM modules side by side with the Docker containers. Uh, there have been a lot of debate going on whether WASM replaces Docker, but the ideal situation is that you're supposed to run Docker uh, containers with these WASM modules and they go hand in hand very nicely because uh, some of the benefits that you get by running uh, Docker containers is that WebAssembly itself is very limited in terms of functionality because of the sandbox model and the security model that you get with WebAssembly. Uh, so you can use the system resources and a bunch of different libraries and functions that you can directly get from your uh, Docker containers. Whereas uh, with WebAssembly, you get very fast execution and fast load times, uh, especially if you're having heavier Docker containers, they can take a lot of time to load up initially when you're like you know, in the warm up stage. So that's the benefit that you get uh, with the WASM containers as well, because they are smaller in size and they have a much faster uh, like you know, load up speed. So the idea is that we are supposed to, we can basically run these side by side in the entire Kubernetes stack. And this is how it, the goal, like you know, it's that if you take a look at the entire Kubernetes landscape, um, you want to be able to run. You you want to be have to be able to have all of your different uh, Kubernetes applications, and then the high level and the low level container runtimes, and run Wasm as part of this entire ecosystem to be able to complement each other. And that's where we'll kind of now go over to the demos, where we'll be showing you the functionality of Wasm Edge and how you could uh, configure them to be able to run on your uh, Edge devices. So we'll now head over to the demos. Sure. So before I go on to the demos, I also want to just mention that uh, uh, we also have some uh, benchmarks. So uh, I worked on uh, creating some benchmarks for running TensorFlow Lite models uh, directly with the TensorFlow, uh, with TensorFlow Lite APIs. Uh, on Android devices and iOS devices, as well as uh, as well as running TensorFlow Lite models with Wasm, as well as running TensorFlow Lite models with Wasm and AOT compilation. Uh, if, if that's what you are excited in, we'll not go very deep into those benchmarks right now. But if that's what you are excited in, we have a GitHub repository, and uh, yeah, you'll find uh, all about the differences in time it takes. Uh, another thing I just wanted to quickly mention before we go forward is. Uh, uh, when we were talking about Wasm Edge and Kubernetes, or Wasm and Kubernetes, uh, we, we particularly want to share that uh, uh, the idea of having Linux containers and Wasm containers side by side is a great one because uh, we want you to take a look at running your Edge applications with Wasm, but we don't want you to, to run all the processes on Wasm. And uh, I, I would again like to uh, take this by an analogy and say, uh, CPU, GPU, and TPUs. If you're running a YouTube video, you probably don't want to use a TPU there, uh, which is the same case over here too. You don't want to use uh, WASM containers ideally for all your tasks. For a lot of your tasks, Linux containers would work just as well. Uh, so the, uh, so uh, one thing we are focusing a lot on um, is having them run side by side, uh, not have all your processes on just a Linux container or just a WASM container. So I'll start out with a demo about. Uh, so I'll start out with a demo about. Oh, yeah. So I'll start out with a demo about uh, running Wasm Edge apps, and uh, uh, we have a few demos over here. I'll start out with a demo I had been preparing just yesterday, <laughs> and uh, uh, this is uh, running a MobileNet V2 model. Uh, uh, running a MobileNet V2 model with uh, Wasm Edge. 
and uh, I, I want to first show how to run this app locally. Uh, so we'll do that. I, this is also in a GitHub repository. I have spent some time writing some docs so people can understand. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's what we'll be doing today. So I'll start out. Uh, so this is actually a REST application. And uh, let's go. Uh, I, I'll open in uh, what my uh, main.rs looks like. So we, uh, we are essentially using track TensorFlow, which is a pretty popular, uh, uh, which is a pretty popular uh, a way to, oh, yeah. I would like to zoom in a bit, yes. So we are uh, actually, uh, I'm actually using track TensorFlow over here, which is a pretty popular way to run machine learning on, uh, uh, machine learning with Rust. It's a pretty popular library, and uh, it's actually multi-threaded. Wasm doesn't support multi-threads, so we have made some changes into how Tract is loaded, how Tract does some stuff to make uh, to still make it work. Um, but, but essentially, what I want to quickly show over here uh, is that um, we have a uh, we, uh, we have a TensorFlow model over here, uh, which is being loaded. We are doing some pre-processing, just the ideal stuff, putting in an image, and uh, then we are just running the model dot run. Uh, so the TVEC is something uh, I also want to talk about, uh, which is how uh, Wasm uh, how Wasm interacts with the state. And uh, 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 yeah, so uh, I'm simply uh, running a model inference over here uh, in Rust. And uh, what I want to do now is uh, show running this locally. Uh, to do that, I'll first start out with building um, with building this rust application uh, as a as a webassembly uh, module and to do that i'll specify the i'll specify my target to be wasm32 minus uh, uh, you do have to add this uh, uh, install the wasm32 minus wasi target which i've already done so i'll just start uh, i'll just start with uh, uh, building uh, i'll just start with building this rust application uh, and add the target to be wasm32 minus wasi, so it knows that uh, it needs to uh, it needs to create a dot wasm module at the end, and uh, this this will take uh, a bit a uh, bit of time, and I uh, and I would like to do this live. So, um, and this uh, is going to set the stone like over here. That um, this is where this is step where we are taking a Rust function, and this could be used with any other uh, programming language as well. For for example, with C plus plus, you'll be using uh, mscript in, and if you're using like Tiny Go or any other language, this is the step where we are generating the bytecode, uh, the Wasm bytecode that can be used anywhere. Great. So uh, yeah, uh, we'll wait for it to run for a while. Uh, I was expecting it to go faster than this. <laughs> uh, but it seems the internet is a bit slow. But uh, later we'll also talk about uh, WAPT very quickly. Uh, so, uh, oh, yeah. There we have. Oh. Right. Interesting. Hmm. Always the case with live numbers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the most interesting part is it worked yesterday. We did. <laughs> Didn't work out. Uh, okay. Uh, so regardless of that, uh, what I did want to show you was uh, you, you could. Um, so I seem to have some dependency error, um, uh, but. Uh, uh, I seem to have some dependency error, but the GitHub repository does have the right one, at least. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, what I wanted to show you was how you could uh, easily uh, make it as a uh, compile it down as a WebAssembly. So what you'd get is a .wasm file. Uh, now the .wasm file can run anywhere, and um, I also wanted to show you AOT compilation which you can also do with wasm time and wasm edge. Uh, we are just showing an example of AOT compiling with wasm time here. And uh, 
uh, uh, so that that would compile it down to a .c wasm file. You can also get the Linux shared library format uh, to AOT compile this. And then I wanted to run it locally. Uh, I also wanted to talk a bit about the uh, WebAssembly text format. So the WebAssembly text format allows you to get your WebAssembly module um, uh, as a bit readable code, uh, which is pretty helpful for debugging. So I just wanted to show that you can get a dot .wat file as well. Uh, all, all of this is up on a GitHub repository, so I mean, feel free to try it out for yourself. I unfortunately couldn't show it here. Uh, so I'll go back. All right, and uh, also what we want to showcase is the future of serverless functions, right? So as we move ahead from um, writing functions and having to use managed hardware uh, or like you know, resources to be able to run these uh, services, we are of course moving towards a serverless platform which inherently has a number of uh, benefits as compared to your standard uh, like you know, Linux containers or services that you might uh, be using. So if you, instead of like the standard virtual machines, because you get on-demand uh, service and then of course it's very easy to scale it up and down as compared to your standard virtual machines. So that's where uh, WebAssembly is also moving to be a really popular function as a service uh, platform as well. And that's what we also want to showcase with uh, Edge devices as well specifically. Because uh, as we mentioned earlier, that uh, your, some of your prop popular programming languages that are typically used to write these function as service uh, calls, uh, such as Python or JavaScript, are great, but then they do come with resource limitations and uh, like you know, a lot of dependencies that might not run or on various platforms. And that's where WebAssembly comes into picture. And the additional benefit that you also get is the security sandboxing uh, that is uh, typical of WebAssembly. And it provides a lot more isolation to your functions that are being written uh, with this entire uh, infrastructure of being able to write them in WebAssembly. So those are some of the uh, like you know, benefits that come with uh, the serverless computing as well, if, when we are uh, talking in terms of how WebAssembly is now uh, getting into this function as service space. Uh, Rishit, if you want to add. Oh. So for this also, we'll have a demo that we'll quickly demonstrate. So we want to start by showing a demo of um, uh, using Kubernetes and uh, to manage your WebAssembly modules. And the main role that, uh, uh, the main thing we want to um, talk about when using Kubernetes is, um, uh, so we uh, so uh, recently uh, a very interesting talk uh, right here at KubeCon yesterday was the Docker Wasm preview, uh, which is uh, pretty interesting. They just announced it yesterday, um, uh, so they had essentially written one of uh, so they had essentially written a shim uh, in Wasm, uh, which allows you to uh, to, uh, to have containers and directly run them um, uh, with Kubernetes as well. Uh, there is also Crushlet, which is uh, pretty popular and allows you to uh, allows you to run web assemblies uh, on uh, with kubernetes uh, so what we want to uh, also show over here is uh, 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 is um, something we had done to run it with kubernetes manage it with kubernetes and especially we want to show how the shim layer works so you can um, uh, so, so you can run your web assemblies uh, I, I have a Kubernetes cluster here in Azure, uh, and I also have two node pools here. So if I just go to node pools and show you that, I essentially have two node pools called pool one, which is uh, the three nodes for system, and uh, the my wasi pool, which is a single node, and this is a wasi node pool. Uh, so this is kind of the idea we want to talk about. You have a process, you have multiple pods, you run some of the pods on, uh, uh, so not on pool one because that's a system node, probably on pool two, which is a Linux node. Uh, uh, and then you run some pods on the MyWASI pool. Uh, so, so essentially run some of your processes on WASI, uh, which can give you uh, some pretty, um, pre uh, pretty nice uh, improvements uh, over what you might be doing. So. I have two node pools here, and uh, right now what I'll uh, do is um, essentially schedule um, es essentially schedule what I want uh, on uh, the Wasi no uh, on the Wasi node pool, uh, which is what I do with uh, uh, which is what I do with this runtime class. Uh, uh, you uh, you use it with 
schedule it, uh, schedule my pods to be run on the Wasi node pool. And uh, uh, what I also use here, uh, so I have also given the configuration for spin, uh, which is actually taken from the official spin repository. Uh, but uh, 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 that's, again, if you want to go beyond edge use cases, uh, we'll not really talk about that in this demo. We'll just show how you can use Slight uh, as your handler. But I also just put in uh, the official code from the spin repository. Uh, so uh, with that, we also have uh, uh, we also have our container running over here. Uh, this is essentially a WebAssembly converted to a container. And you can do that using WASM2 OCI. Uh, so WASM2 OCI is a pretty popular tool, which allows you to take your WebAssembly modules and um, convert them to um, and convert them to OCI compliant containers uh, and convert them to OCI compliant containers uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, this is what has been done and uh, this is also uh, using the container D wasm shim this is actually one of the examples that uses container D wasm shim um, so uh, yeah uh, uh, we'll just try to run this uh, this is one of the very popularly available containers out there uh, to demonstrate using WebAssembly modules inside Kubernetes. Uh, so we'll just show this. And so I'll start out with uh, getting all the services I have. I do have one load balancer, uh, which is called Wasm Slide, uh, created with uh, this uh, with this configuration itself, and. Uh, I'll, I'll get the extent. So this is a very simple example to show WebAssembly modules running in, or are ma you managing it with Kubernetes? And if I just call this, uh, I, if I just call the a, uh, external uh, API and uh, append a dot hello to it, I should just probably get a hello. Uh, how, uh, which is what this container does. Uh, it just prints out hello. Uh, uh, but it uses uh, Wasm and uh, Wasi under the hood uh, to do this uh, to get uh, to get the system calls and so on. Uh, we also have some more examples with uh, running a TensorFlow model uh, all in Wasm and managing it with Kubernetes. But we are already at 10 a.m. So uh, uh, so that was uh, about our talk. And uh, thank you so much for hearing us. Thank you. We've got time for some questions, if anybody's got any. Raise your hand, and we'll bring you the mic. Um, you were saying before that you don't think we should run all the workloads as WASM modules. Um, there are some that are better fit for uh, a regular container and others uh, that are probably more suitable for Wasm. Uh, which workloads do you see Wasm shine? Like when would you say, yes, this is a good candidate to use for wa uh, as a Wasm container instead as a regular one? Sure. So as we give an example for machine learning over here, right? So when we're doing machine learning inference, uh, we need it to be very quick. Now, such kind of more high computational tasks where you would need, uh, because it will take time, right, to compute, uh, to do the inference. So those are kind of tasks where you can use Wasm because of the faster load time for actually spinning up a Wasm a cluster and being able to run a Wasm container. Because of the small size and quick uh, inference, right, you'll want to do all of those such kind of tasks using your Wasm uh, container. Whereas with Docker, you could run all of your system uh, files and all the system calls using your Docker container because it's well supported uh, because of the entire ecosystem of Docker containers and like you know being able to make system calls. That's where you are going to be using the interface between both Docker and Wasi. But specifically, if you are asking for like uh, the use case for Wasm, it's mainly for doing all these high inference tasks. Any other questions, comments? Is there, a, is there an upward bound of how big a, a WASM binary, or whatever you want to call it, can be? I mean, I'm thinking about AI models that get very, very large sometimes. Uh, 
Do you mind repeating the question, please? Oh, sure. um, I'm wondering if there's like an upper bound to like the size of an executable, or not executable, but a bytecode executable for Wasm for like large AI models and things like that. Oh, so is the question regarding like for the Wasm executables for larger models? Right. Should don't take it up? Oh, sure. So uh, ideally for larger models, uh, I mean, you can still use Wasm, uh, but uh, I, I would urge, urge you to uh, uh, for, first evaluate whether the model can be used on edge devices itself. Um, uh, I mean, uh, Wasm would allow you to raise the bar, taking even more larger models and what something like TensorFlow Lite would allow you to do. Uh, and and uh, I've been one of the contributors on TensorFlow Lite myself. Uh, but uh, 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 Wasm definitely raises the bar when used with TensorFlow Lite. Um, but uh, f for very large models, uh, I, I think uh, w w one of the right ways would be to uh, uh, work on optimizing the model itself. Uh, if it's a pretty large model. Uh, in terms of Wasm and the stock, uh, so to get back onto the track, um, I, I, the, uh, the Wasm counterpart uh, uh, will raise the bar because, um, because of the lower container sizes. So one of the examples we show is with the TensorFlow MobileNet V2, uh, uh, mob mob TensorFlow MobileNet V2 model. Uh, a Linux container to run the TensorFlow MobileNet V2 model uh, even if you try to make optimizations in size, uh, would be at least 20 to 30 times larger in size than the Wasm container. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, you, uh, so Wasm already does a great job at uh, raising the bar, in essence, if that answers the question.